afternoon. Um, subject is uh, I need to talk about Bandhan Bank, uh, with which I am associated with uh, as an advisor strategy, and also my own transformation, or should I say, migration from a journalist to an author. Now, on the second part, I'm not very sure what do I say because this is nothing unique about it. I mean, in India and globally, there are many instances of uh, journalists uh, turning author, writing books. Maybe the reasons are different, you know. Uh, once you get expertise, somebody on stock markets, uh, the person writes on markets. Somebody on Kashmir Valley, he or she writes on Kashmir. Uh, in my case, uh, the provocation was slightly different. Uh, you know, it's, uh, probably a streak of adventurism there in me, so I always look for some fun. Uh, in fact, to become a journalist also, I ended up by being accident. It's a purely an accident because uh, in the 80s in West Bengal, and I'm a student of English literature, there was not many avenues to do. So one thing you try for civil service, which I tried, did not get. Second one was uh, to teach in a college, which I did, but I did not like. So what do you do? Uh, somebody said that, why don't you try to become a journalist? It's, a, it's no, not a paying job, but you can actually have a uh, world view or part side view uh, in contrast to one view of any other job. So I tried and surprisingly I got it. So I landed in Mumbai in, a, in the country's largest national newspaper, uh, which is a political paper, meaning the white paper. Uh, and doing theatre reviews and film reviews and lots of other things and then again by accident I uh, stepped into business journalism and sometime in mid 90s I was thrown into banking reporting which I did not know anything about. But as I said, uh, you always, if you have a streak of adventurism you try to uh, have some fun. So when I saw that, well fine I'm getting into reporting and getting headlines and all so why not do something else, what is that, uh, try to become a commentator. For that, you need to convince people that you know. You need to pretend that you know and you need to convince. It's a bit of a fake job. So people started to get convinced that, yes, this is a gentleman who understands finance, even though I have no background, uh, because I have the ability to ask stupid questions. And unless I am convinced, I don't write. That was my formula of little bit understanding. So I became a commentator sometime, uh, writing a column uh, in my former paper. Yeah. And then I continued uh, as a banker's trust for the last 12 years in Mint. And then while doing that, I thought, why not do something else? So I got into uh, sort of running a serial on TV uh, episodes, some 36, 40 episodes on banking and finance by the same name. And then I started holding roundtable discussions on banking, etc., etc. And then sometime a publisher asked me to write a book on HGFC Bank. I thought, why not? And the idea behind this bank and the publishers approaching me was because this is India's most valued bank. Uh, there is investors' interest and people want to know. I thought, yes, that's correct, but it is also the uh, child of economic liberalization. So I thought, uh, let's, let's look, at, uh, look at the bank from that point of view, that once you have freedom to do uh, things on your own, if you are really care for corporate governance and ethics and if you know your business, you are ready to take up challenge, you can even in India become a world class bank. So that was the story and the biggest lesson for uh, writing there I found that in banking what you don't do is much more important than what you do. And then I thought let's do something else. I tried to look at shadow banking and the alleged irregularities or money laundering, alleged money laundering by the Sahara Group. So it was a very different uh, investigative journalism, investigative uh, book. And even the book was published, uh, I was uh, clamped with a 200 court defamation suit in a high court, which was later I think, almost sent to Supreme Court, so on and so forth. So I had to fight it out and then uh, we came out with the book. Um, it's an investigative journalism on money laundering and shadow banking. Uh, it didn't have any definitive answer, but it raised some uh, valid questions on the business model of Sahara. And then my last book is uh, a collection of essays from uh, Lehman to Demonetization, what has happened in Indian banking, all this, uh, which Andy Mukherjee touched upon, uh, the pile of bad assets, among many other things. In between, I wrote a book which is very close to my heart and which is relevant in your context, uh, remaining uh, uh, rural India, is Bandhan, the making of a bank. Now, this is a book uh, which actually uh, 
traces the the case of it's a case study you can say loosely of India's first microfinance entity becoming a bank, universal bank. This is also the first ba uh, first entity which got license uh, to become a bank uh, in the eastern part of the country after the independence. Now, as you know, getting a bank license in India is the ultimate in corporate governance, uh, in your ability, in your efficiency in running this entity. Because anything else, uh, you uh, you want to have a coal mine, you want to you know. Uh, get into gas, you want to get into spectrum, you pay and get the license. But banking is something where you need to convince the regulator, you can't buy the license, you have to be fit and proper to get the license. And it's a highly regulated entity. Uh, so there is a, there is a, um, between HDFC book, which is called a bank for the buck, which traces the, uh, the, the birth and the, how it, how the bank flourished, uh, the India's finest bank, uh, most valued bank, and the child of liberalization, and Bandhan Bank, which India's first microfinance entity transforming into a bank. It's more or less a similar. You you trace the history of a bank, you tell their story, and as I said, I don't understand much the banking and finance, so I have some as a common person, I raise some stupid questions. I try to answer them so that everybody else, um, even my grandma, I'm not being, um, I don't have any gender bias, but saying that even she can read and understand this. So these are all the bank story, but there's a difference. In HDFC bank, I, it was a second hand information because uh, I spoke to people, hundreds of people in India and overseas and got their story and weaved the story. Because I started bank reporting uh, a little later, a few years later uh, uh, than HDFC Bank was born. But in Bandhan Bank, somehow I got involved even before it became a bank. So uh, this is it's somehow a sort of insider's perspective. Uh, what was the, what was the, and both the books are not sponsored book by the individual in the, uh, entities. It's my project, it's the publisher's project and they had no right to uh, interfere. Uh, they all cooperated in terms of giving me data and telling me stories, but ultimate project, product uh, was, re uh, was resting on me. And I refused to actually even give them the script and I always tell them, look, Sahara was there. Uh, they filed a 200 code case against me. You are welcome to do that if you find anything wrong. But I would not allow anybody to interfere. Now, why, what was the provocation of writing a book on Bandhan? Uh, because that's the time, I think, uh, last 30 years, I'm in Bombay, uh, little more than 30 years, but I thought it's an opportunity to see the real India uh, and when, uh, how genuine or how fake is this movement of financial inclusion, how do I see it? So when this uh, promoter, Chandrasekhar Ghosh, approached me uh, that why don't you join me as an advisor, I, I thought it's a golden opportunity to see how a bank is born and if not anything else, I can become a better writer, better, better uh, uh, journalist. So that was the provocation. I left Mumbai uh, and then I actually uh, joined him in Kolkata and I traveled extensively um, in the various parts of India, uh, particularly in the East and North East, to find out how actually is the myth of uh, you know, microfinance changing people's life, how it is true or false. Now, there are many books on microfinance in India and overseas, but there's a basic difference between my book and the other, because the other books are broadly, uh, you know, they fall into two categories. One is uh, writing, written by the promoters or the entrepreneurs, but written from the angle of how it is, uh, it has benefited the masses. So it's a bit of romanticizing the entire thing, the people's lives have changed, they have got money, uh, they have been lifted from the so-called bottom of the pyramid, they are living good lives, so on and so forth. Other part, other books are very academic, you know, full of data and analytics and IRR, internal rate of return. So even though the borrowers are uh, paying high interest rates, but still their, their uh, business model is as such, they can actually pay back and they do well, etc. But my approach to the entire thing was very different. I wanted to see it from an organizational point of view. How do you build an organization? Because this Chandrasekhar Ghosh's story fascinated me sitting in Mumbai. I was tracking him because I had tremendous respect for him. I have rather, till continues to be. That not only for giving loans to millions of customers, but also giving jobs to thousands of people. 
So by 2014, when he was preparing to become a bank, already 14,000 people on the payroll. And mind you, he is operating in West Bengal, which is politically very volatile. First the left rule and now the Trinamool rule, where the jobs are not easily created, where uh, you know it's, it's very difficult terrain to operate as an entrepreneur. So that was fascinated me. And then I found out how he got into this business. He uh, started in Dhaka University Statistics, then joined BRAC, uh, uh, which is the uh, world's largest NGO in the poverty alienation area. And then he came back to India with this, this thing. He started his own knitting, uh, uh, knitting machine uh, sort of uh, factory uh, in North Calcutta. And then he was watching uh, near North Calcutta Shobha market. Uh, the women, a group of women are gathering every morning and one burly gentleman in a red t-shirt coming on his bike and in the morning distributing 500 rupees to all these women. Coming back in the evening and picking up 505 rupees. So he, he watched it for a few days and then he asked these women uh, in his own immutable way, very modest way, he called every woman a Didi and every boy probably exclusive, uh, excluding his own son, Dada, in Bengali, elder brother and elder sister. Didi, how are you offering 1% interest rate for 12 years, 12 hours? Which means you are offering actually 2% per day and 7-30% per, per year. I mean, how is it done? This woman told him, look, we are not offering him 1% or 7-30% interest a year. We are offering him just a cup of tea. I'm talking about 1999 when tea cost 5 rupees. Uh, we are just offering a cup of tea and with this money we are going to the wholesale market buying cauliflower, uh, spinach, cabbage and selling it here and making enough money to pay him, uh, this, give him this cup of tea. Besides, where do I go? Who will give me money? We are illiterate, we don't know even how to sign my name. And the banks they ask, they don't trust us, they will sue us away. And we don't have, the, I, don't, I don't have any even address, how do I get bank loan? So that's, that's the proverbial Eureka movement for him. That's how he started. He, he put in all his uh, collection of, I mean, all his little savings, two lakh. And 2001, he formed an NGO and he started giving money to that. And then later, CDB stepped in with 20 lakh uh, debt. And the rest, you, you know, it's a kind of history. It is now the world. It has become a bank. And it is, um, it's, it's now the world's, I, I read in newspaper report, the most expensive bank in terms of price to book. Uh, I'm not going here, I'm not coming here to market this uh, particular entity here, but I just want to tell you a few lessons what I've learned. How do you do it? How do you keep your cost in check? And how do you actually spread this uh, financial inclusion uh, in the area of, uh, you know, in the rural India? How you do people, how do you change people's lives? What I found is this, you know, Bandhan, uh, in this case, it's not an entity. It's a sort of cult. It's a way of life. So when I am in urban area, I am a bank uh, customer of bank A or bank B or bank C, we are just a customer of bank A and bank B or bank C. We carry a credit card or debit card and uh, do net banking. But here I found that these women, they actually think that it is their bank. Because I have met so many women and all. Uh, in 2002, 2003, 2004, like they started with 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 rupees loan. And now they are taking 1 lakh, 1 lakh 20,000 loan. In turn, they are actually now employing 5 or 10 people. Uh, they are probably doing jerry work or some other textile work or uh, selling vegetables, selling fish and all. So entire thing is, we, and you know, now they have a little fridge at home uh, where uh, during summer children are playing and they are keeping ice cream or distribute ice. So they have actually raised in the in the society. People uh, look and respect them, and they think that it's it's Bandhan has changed this. So I asked one lady in Assam that how how, and that's what I got the idea how they feel. It's like an umbilical cord. I said, how long you have been with Bandhan? He said, look, this is the boy. That boy was some eight year old. When I was on my way to mother, the boy was in my here, yeah. so I became a Bandhan bank a customer. And now this boy is eight year old, and my relationship with also bank with the eight year old. So I found this, you know, they correlate with their own human relationship with the relationship with the bank, and that has happened because of the connectivity. That has happened because of the connectivity. I am not against technology. For God's sake, don't misunderstand me. Because my next book, actually, I am writing on digitalization on banking system, which will be released sometime in 2019, January. Mr. Nandan Nikali is writing the foreword to that. 
but I'm not against it, but I found that in rural India, the technology can be an enabler. It cannot be a product itself. Now here, I can keep my cost low, uh, my default low, and the regular collection because I am meeting people once a week. So 52 times a week, I am meeting my followers. So there is a connectivity. I am there with her. In most of the cases, there are women. I am there with her when she is suffering from fever. I just give her a sort of, uh, you know, um, over-the-counter uh, tablet and a cup of tea. I go, you know, go to their house and do that. And she just feel that, well, I am not a bank. I am actually a family. I pick her uh, children from the, when playing in the mud, I just pick, pick her up, the little daughter, and you know, put it on my uh, lap and give her a five rupee toffee or six rupee or ten rupee glucose biscuit. And I earn their gratitude, their respect, uh, their love, their affection like anything. So the challenge is, and this is the model if you want to keep, and then how do I, how do I actually keep the collection uh, moving and all? I do, I, I employ the son of the soil, the local people who understand the ethnicity, the dialect, the culture, but not, not exactly local in the same, the same area. Because if I do that, then I will f figure out, they, 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 this person will start giving money to the uncle and aunt and my uh, non-performing assets will go up. So I pick up people from the same area, but maybe maybe 50 kilometers distance, where he can't exploit this relationship thing and all. So there are little, little tricks, but there are, uh, time is running out. So the uh, I can actually spend a full day talking on that, but the two key lesson in, uh, in the financial inclusion space in rural India, what I found is this, one is this, it cannot be done by, uh, by NGOs, and no offense to the NGOs, but if you are doing this financial you know, help to people, not help is the right word, uh, giving money to them at sort of interest, you can't depend on funds, because fund flow you cannot ensure. And these people need hand-holding continuously. I need 5,000 today, 10,000 tomorrow, 15,000 day after, 20,000 day after, after. So you know, I need a continuous flow of funds. Uh, if you are an entity which is, uh, which is depending on the fund flow from, from, from Belgium or Holland or any other parts of Europe or, or US or something like that, you cannot ensure the fund flow. So it doesn't work. And so it has to be a business project. And second part of it is this, a bleeding heart cannot change rural India. A bleeding heart needs, you have a combination of bleeding hearts and a thinking mind with a business sense. So because if you give people money free, they will take you for granted, they will return your, uh, they will not return your money. For them, it's the access to fund which is more important than the cost of fund. What does that mean? That means they don't, as long as they get the money, uh, they don't compare it with a, with a urban customer which gets money at 10 or 11 percent. Uh, they, they don't expect it. They are ready to pay 20 or 22 percent. Uh, it's fine as long as it's not 60 or 80 or 100 percent of a money lender. So don't compare that with, uh, uh, with the urban banks and urban customers. You compare them with the money lender. Uh, that's the thing. The cost of small borrowing globally, it's more expensive than the main street banking. So this is the two key lessons I've got, uh, is this, uh, don't look at it as a CSR activity. Look at it from a business point of view. You need to make money out of it because you are responsible for your investors, for your employees, for your family, for your own livelihood. At the same time, you also need to do good to the society. So this combination, doing good to the society and doing good business, I call it a sort of compassionate capitalism. That, that's the way I think right way to go. And of course, along with the fund, you also need to handhold them and then you have a credit plus approach. So you need to you need to follow an ecosystem where you do beyond banking. Well, what does that mean? That means that you know, uh, running vocational training centers, running schools for children, running uh, restitute centers, so on and so forth. You do it free, this is supposedly CSR activity, but you are doing it with actually a motive Motive is not the right word, with the intention of creating an ecosystem where the people take ownership and the people say, it's my organization, it's not other. So you, you bring down the cost of default to the minimum. So that, that's the way, and all these things are happening because our mainstream banking system in, is inefficient, it's a repressive banking system, it does not want to go 
beyond beyond the area of uh, urban centers because it thinks that it is not they can't make money out of it so that's the biggest question if you ask me if the rural people in india are actually bankable so well, they are not the people who will take thousands of crores of loan and then take a flight uh, and then leave india and uh, will not come back then you have to reach out to the other countries and get them back i'm not naming in name so to the the lesson for the banking system is this don't look at it as a regulatory requirement to reach out to them look at it as a business opportunity you will not regret it thank you